Hi everybody, uh, we're going to work on chapter two today, which is the central dogma of molecular biology. And we're going to go through what is a gene, the structure of DNA, the central dogma, a little bit about gene uh, structure, function, regulation, and what is genetics. Okay. So here we go, 2.1 in your books. What is a gene? So there are really two ways to talk about a gene what it is and what it does. For a long time, we didn't know what it is, so we had to discuss it in terms of what it does. And what it, in that case, it's a unit of inheritance, something that's passed down from parent to child between generations. And people came up with a lot of different words for this, and it's sort of coalesced around the word gene. Right? It's kind of hard to define. It's a bit of a nebulous quantity. So our chromosomes are very, very long strands of deoxyribonucleic acid. And a gene is a particular place on that chromosome, a sequence of nucleotides that, when transcribed and translated, form a gene product. So when we talk about a gene, we can at least talk about defining characteristics, the things that something has to have in order to be considered a gene. First, it has to be able to be replicated. You have to be able to make a copy of it and give that to your offspring so it can be transmitted to the next generation, which includes um, a chance of error. Every time you copy this, there could be something new happening, and that's mutation, changes to the DNA uh, sequence. The other part is, is that the gene has to be expressed. Like that protein has to be made to produce a phenotype or maybe a component of a phenotype like uh, receptors on the outside of a blood cell or a muscle fiber or pigment, something like that. That protein has to be made into a discernible phenotype. And a phenotype is something we can see and that we can measure. And this brings us to what is DNA? How is it? So DNA is a long polymer which is made up of subunits called deoxyribonucleotides, shortened as DNTPs. Okay. The triphosphate group here, the TP part, is the same in all nucleotides. The sugar is the same as well if you're talking about DNA. And then the nucleotide base will vary depending on whether or not it's adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. The sugar phosphate backbone part here is made up of the triphosphate groups and the sugar. Okay, so. Uh, the phosphate group is attached to the deoxyribose, the sugar part here at the five prime carbon. There's five, ribose is a five carbon sugar. So we've got one here, two, three, four, and then the CH2 group is the fifth sugar, okay? So the phosphate that's attached to that five prime will interact with the three prime carbon of the degrowing DNA chain. So this guy over here is gonna attach to the next DNA over here at the three prime. So this deoxyribose has a specific orientation, okay? There's our numbered carbons, one through five. And then here is what makes deoxyribose deoxy. If it was ribose sugar, it would have an oxygen here at the two prime. So when we talk about how DNA is synthesized or built in terms of replication or anything along those lines, uh, there's a directionality to it. We talk about three prime to five prime end of DNA, and this is what we're referring to, is whether or not it's this end with the three prime carbon on this ribose sugar or the five prime carbon on the ribose sugar, okay? So we've got our incoming DNTP here, and what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a release of energy from these guys, uh, the two phosphate groups flying off here, and we get one, the one closest phosphate group is gonna be a chain in between this five prime carbon and this three prime carbon. Okay. And so another uh, nucleotide here is going to show up and that the phosphate group off of that five prime is going to link up to the three prime. And then we're going to have our DNA chain getting longer and longer. So this end here is our three prime end of the DNA chain. And this here is our five prime end of the DNA chain. DNA molecules are getting added to this three prime end. So this chain has a five prime to three prime polarity as it's getting added on. We consider this five prime the start of the chain and the three prime is the end of the chain. So when we talk about the DNA double helix running anti-parallel, these two strands going anti-parallel, 
it means that we've got this, the two phosphate backbones here and we have our um, hydrogen bonds between our nucleotides, but that these um, strands, one is running five prime to three prime and the other is running three prime to five prime. They're going in opposite directions in terms of the, the directionality of the strands. Of course, as they do this, they're going to form a double helix with a major groove and a minor groove spiral around each other. And so this phosphate backbone on the outside is negative, okay? So it's making the DNA act as though it's an acid. Well, it is deoxyribonucleic acid, right? And so, but this has kind of a bit of a negative charge there. And so that's gonna determine how it interacts with water, other proteins, how chromosomes are built, and even how gel electrophoresis happens and works. So the four nitrogenous bases of DNA here, we've got thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. Okay, there's two classes here, the pyrimidines, where I kind of imagine that these are like the base of a little pyramid piece or some sort of game token, right? It's just one uh, circle here. Whereas the purines have two ring structures over here. They have, they're sort of uh, classy, classy uh, things over here. We'll, we'll call them infinity loops. Yes, that's the word. And we're going to use um, that as our mnemonic here. Purines are purely loopy, and pyrimidines are the base of a cool pyramid. All right. So, um, yes, you are going to need to know the structures of those. So, when we look at our base pairing, uh, one purine is always going to link up with one pyrimidine. Okay, so the pairing between the purine and the pyrimidine keeps this consistent distance between the two strands. So thymine or pyrimidine is always going to loop up with adenine or purine, okay, AT. And then cytosine, our single pyrimidine over here, is always going to loop up with guanine or purine, all right? So in the AT pairing, we've got two hydrogen bonds forming here. In the cytosine guanine, we're gonna have three hydrogen bonds forming. Okay, so this pairing is stronger. It takes more energy to break than just the two bonds up here. So now, which of these base pairs is in which position is what's gonna give us our genetic code. Okay, with the order of A, G, C, T along one strand is our DNA code, and we read it from five prime to three prime. Okay, if you know the sequence of one strand, then you can determine the other by matching it up with its pair. Now base pairs uh, is BP. This is kind of the unit, the length of DNA is how many of these pairs are going on. So I'm not asking, generally we're not going to get into, oh, am I asking for nucleotides or am I asking for base pairs? We're just going to talk about base pairs. Um, so in this case, this picture right here, there are eight nucleotides, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but we have four base pairs, one, two, three, four. Okay. And that's what we're really concerned about is how many base pairs long is, say, a section of DNA. Okay. So here's another one here. So this is one coil, and we fit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine base pairs along one of those coils. One of the most powerful tools we have for sorting DNA by size is called gel electrophoresis. In this case, what we're doing is we're pulling DNA through a gel matrix based on its electrical charge. Now, DNA has a negative overall charge, thanks to the sugar phosphate backbone there, so it's going to be pulled toward the positive electrode, away from the uh, negative electrode. Okay, and this happens in a buffer solution that transmits electrical current, and those pieces of DNA will be slowly pulled through the gel over time. So let's walk through how this works. We're gonna put our DNA in near the negative electrode, and it's going to move through the gel toward the positive electrode, but the shorter pieces are gonna move a lot faster than the longer pieces, because this gel is made up like a matrix of agar and stuff, and it's a little tricky for very large things to move through. So if you're invading the forest moon of Endor, and there's a lot of these huge trees around, your AT, AT um, all-terrain armored transports are going to take, they're just going to be slow. They're going to have to stop, maybe shoot down some trees and such. There's slow going there. So you're going to send in your um, all-terrain scout troop walkers, the ATSTs, which are going to move at a better pace. But if you really want to get through uh, this terrain, these scout uh, troopers on speeder bikes are really going to move the fastest. Okay, so the smallest DNA pieces are going to move the longest through your gels just like stormtroopers.
So now that we've sorted our DNA fragments by size on this gel, the next thing to do is actually see them. So we use uh, what's called the stain, and the most popular one is called the thidium bromide. And what it does is it sandwiches itself in between uh, adenine thymine base pairs. So over here, let me grab my little marker pen mural right here in between that uh, in the DNA helix and it sticks there and the great thing is it fluoresces under UV light so you can put your gel on top of a UV uh, light source and usually use a camera and take a picture of your gel and here you can see the, the UV light is flaring up wherever the DNA has collected in the gel. The next piece of DNA structure that makes a huge difference in what we can do in terms of manipulating DNA is this complementary base pairing. It's really the biggest principle in molecular biology, the fact that A and T are always going to pair together and C and G are going to pair together. So this is where the whole premise of DNA replication in nature, transcription, RNA splicing, translation, all happens. And then in the laboratory, we can use this in order to sequence DNA, to hybridize different pieces of nucleic acid together to perform PCR, eventually even get to gene editing and genetic modification. So hybridization is a key tool that we use to um, manipulate nucleic acids. And it really relies on this idea of base pairing. It's the basis of PCR and RNA seq and just pretty much all the DNA molecular analysis techniques that we have. The idea that if we take two different strips of DNA, so here's the oligonucleotide over here, just sort of a short group uh, strip, strip of DNA here in our target DNA. If we denature these strands, pull them apart, mix them together, and let them anneal slowly and close this gap, that area that has similar sequences, they will match up together and they will form a hybrid here, okay? Hybrid we're referring to, this could be RNA or DNA, this could be RNA or DNA, and these guys are gonna still match up. So now that we could hybridize a known piece of DNA to something else, not knowing where that next piece is, if we take some a dye, fluorescing dye, and add that to our nucleotides in our probe, when we hybridize that to, say, an unknown giant strip of DNA like a chromosome, it will fluoresce and show us exactly where on the chromosome, yoink, that particular sequence winds up. So this has a lot of interesting practical applications, uh, not just for knowing where on a chromosome uh, a gene is located, but things like where in a cell is RNA being trucked around and, and expressed, and also plays a huge role in how our current generation of sequencing technology works by flaring uh, different colors at different points on the, on the DNA strand in order to calculate the uh, sequence of that strand.